Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the second segment of Morning Break. We hope you're relaxed and settled with a hot drink, ready to enjoy the rest of the show. Okay, now it's time to introduce our guest, Sister Ruhi Rizvi. Thank Slav. you very much for coming to the show. Walaikum as Lovely to have you. Um, let's, let's talk, you're a paediatric nurse and I'm sure that you've got loads of a wealth of experience to kind of share with us. Can you tell us a bit about your work? Bismillah rahman rahim Yes, um, I've got experience of working with uh, general paediatrics for over six years now. And, I've, um, you know, we work with children from the age of um, when they're new newly born to us and uh, we cater for children and uh, care for their needs up until the age of 16, which is our cut-off point with them. And then obviously they get transferred to adult wards. Um, and basically we care for the acutely ill child, children that come in with rare disorders, some we have oncology patients, which are the, our children that have uh, been diagnosed with cancer, leukemia, uh, tumours and things like that. We have children that come in with metabolic disorders. Some of them have to be transferred out to other, uh, other hospitals. And uh, basically we just provide them with the care that they should receive, mm -hmm. which is yeah. we aim to have good quality of care. Yeah. It's really interesting, actually, mm. to see what different careers people do, you know. I mean, uh, what, the, what Sister Ruhi does is so different to what you and I do, and yeah. it's very interesting to just have a glimpse into someone's life and mm -hmm. to see what motivates them in, into what they're doing. Um, so what kind of, how did you decide to choose to become a paediatric nurse? What led you to that path? Well, um, Alhamdulillah, I was experienced in uh, working with children with special needs uh, for a very, very long time in schools. and. Um, I think uh, it brought on that I needed to work more hands-on with them and do more clinical care with them, which I wasn't able to do when I was um, in the education department. Um, but, you know, you could see the children that they required more health um, uh, care specifically to their needs, and which I felt was um, an important part of um, what I wanted actually to do with the children because mm -hmm. um, I think when you're doing more hands-on care, I think you satisfy yourself uh, that you're providing the, yeah. uh, the actual care that that child actually yeah. needs. <clears throat> Absolutely. So what kind of, on that note, what kind of cases do you see on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, we have children um, that come in with a lot of metabolic disorders. Mm -hmm. We have children that, um, that are di di newly diagnosed with um, cancer. We have newly diagnosed leukemia patients, children mm. with tumours um, and you know there's there's just so many rare illnesses that children are diagnosed on a daily basis and it's um, it's heartbreaking at some points but um, you know you find that they, you know, there's just so many different different types of illnesses that children come is in with. Is it very different uh, paediatric medicine to, you know, the sorts of things that adults come in with or is it similar things but you just deal with it in a different way uh, for children? I think there can be some similar, mm -hmm. there can be some similar care that we can provide for the adult uh, as well as the paediatric but I think paediatric comes in form where you do have children's parents staying overnight with us at, uh, right. at certain, uh, you know, over the night time yes. period. Um, and it gives us some sort of support, which obviously mm. you won't require when you're adult nursing. I was just going to say that probably uh, you have to do a lot of, you have to give a lot of emotional support to mm. the parents. It's not just about looking after the children. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure it's very distressing for, uh, for parents and family members to have a child in hospital, you know, so mm. you probably have to give a lot of emotional support in that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. I mean, the children, uh, the parents, um, you know, they're totally heart heartbroken over the child's uh, newly diagnosed uh, children I mean, that come in specifically that they don't know what's happening to their child mm. and it's quite daunting for them uh, as parents to not exactly know what's happening to our child. Yeah. There are certain issues that we have uh, where children have been newly diagnosed but because uh, their cognitive level is so small at that particular point um, that they don't make sense of what, they've, uh, what illness they have yeah. but parents do and if they you know, they're looking for us to give them support. Yeah. Um, they don't have knowledge, they don't have background knowledge as mm -hmm. to what, why that medical uh, situation or medical uh, circumstances have ar arisen with their child. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, you know, it is daunting on them. So we try to give them as much support as we can um, uh, during the time of their stay in hospital. And um, Do you have to be careful about what you say to them or um, do you need to be, do you have a medical duty to be quite honest about, you know, if they say to me, to you, what's the worst case scenario? Mm -hmm. You know, it must be hard to be yeah. able to delicately yeah. put that. Well, every nurse, uh, every paediatric nurse is held by uh, certain policies and it means that we can't step over our boundaries. Mm. So it means that um, the information that we do relate to our parents um, 
or patients is based on the information we are only allowed to tell them. Usually this is uh, the job uh, by the registrar or, or the consultant in, uh, in charge of the patient or who's, um, who the patient comes under. Mm. And uh, it's for us to just support the parents right. once they've received that information with regards to the care that we need to provide them with. Okay. It sounds like it's such an intense job and obviously your emphasis so far has been very much on you supporting both the child and the family as well. Does that make it really difficult emotionally? Do you A, find that like straining on you in terms of emotion and B, do you find that you get yourself attached to the individual as well? It's a strain, it feels like a, um, a strain. Uh, during the course of the day when you're with the patients and you know that there's one coming in and there's admission and then you've got things that you need to do. Mm. But, um, you know, if you're providing the care adequately, it seems to take off the strain by the end of the day because you know that you've done something well with them and mm. um, it's, it is satisfactory when you go home and you think, OK, I made a difference today. Mm. Um, with regards to the emotional attachment, I think... Um, we love our children. I mean, to me, you know, all the children that come into hospital are all my children. Mm -hmm. You know, I see it uh, as that. Um, you actually referred earlier to our child or <laughs> our children, actually, which I noticed. Which yeah. is, it's lovely because it, it shows how committed you are to your job. Yeah, I just feel that, you know, all these children, you know, they're my children when I'm looking after them, I'm caring for them. I don't take that responsibility away from the parents, yeah. um, don't get me wrong. But, um, you know, it's our duty mm. um, as part of... the. Uh, as part of the um, hospital environment and setting to be able to provide the care for those children and we try to do as much as we can uh, mm. as well as we can to be mm. honest um, and the attachment that I sometimes form with the children is based on the fact that you know um, they may be crying they may not have their parents with them at that particular mm. point in time the illnesses are quite rare um, you know it's that sort of scenario you, you're faced with on a daily basis and you think you know what today we want to make a difference to the care that we provide and it's an indiv individualized care that we provide them with yeah. so it does make a difference on how much attachment we do have with them yeah and do you find that for example i'm assuming anyway if i'm not mistaken that you do have to experience seeing young children pass away am i right in saying that you're absolutely right it's um does that affect your iman at all does um, it does it because it must be heartbreaking. Does it ever affect the way you that you have a question, view? you know, why did this happen? Yes, it does. Um, recently I had a case um, on the ward that I was faced with and it was a Muslim child that um, uh, was faced with a very rare disorder mm -hmm. and um, it doesn't really have a good quality of life and uh, it's expected that that child will die in, in a few months' time. But obviously, the, to me, as part of my Iman, I always think that you know life is in the hands of Allah and um, how he wants to resort, restore or preserve the life of that child is you know in the hands of Allah. Um, you know when that child was diagnosed with that disorder and we were told that with the life expectancy of that child isn't very long mm -hmm. then what tends to happen is that we're expecting the parents to make some sort of decision as to whether that child needs to be resuscitated or not okay. and whether doctors find it um, that is that you know the order needs to be passed by the parents themselves, mm -hmm. and they have to. It's very heart difficult for them and heartbreaking for them to have to make such a, you know, uh, make, decision. Absolutely, yeah. it's a it's a huge decision for the parents yeah. to make. But you have to respect, as a part of your nursing care, that any decision that is made by the parents, you have to respect it, mm -hmm. and it that is an ethical issue in itself. And mm -hmm. where I was faced with on uh, one of my shifts was that. You know, if, if he didn't require resuscitation, mm -hmm. um, then if I need to, if he goes into a cardiac arrest or a respiratory attack, do I do I need to do something about yeah. it? And if I don't do something about it, is that uh, uh, DNR order, which is do not resuscitate right. order, is it still valid or is it not valid? Right. And at that point in time was uh, the time when I actually thought, you know, if I save the life of this child, am I doing justice to my iman or am I faced with a dilemma, an ethical dilemma from the nursing point of view. So that's the sort of issues that we are faced mm. on uh, on a daily basis. Very yeah. interesting. Do you ever see um, a difference between, uh, you know, any particular cases amongst Muslim children, Muslim families that come in, something that's more common uh, with them? Uh, is there any difference between kind of your Muslim families and non-Muslim families yeah. at all? Well, I've, um, in my experience in the last six years, and I've worked uh, uh, between three or four different hospitals, and I've noticed that in a certain environment um, where the ethnic minorities are a larger amount, mm. Uh, 
um, on the ward we find that we have a lot of Muslim parents where the cousins have married together. So yeah. those sort of genetic disorders um, do arise in those children and um, uh, we, uh, we are told that, you know, obviously it's not, um, it's not a practice that a Western uh, society is... Do they find that strange, your colleagues, that uh, cousins might marry each other? I mean, is that, is that something that they are shocked at? Or? They are, and they do find that it's extraordinary that um, we don't give enough information to our um, Muslim community mm. about the cousin marriages, mm. uh, you know, first cousin marriages that yeah. we have. Yeah. But um, it seems that there is research out there which suggests yeah. that, um, you know, one in, four child, uh, one in four children that are born to Muslim um, parents that are cousins, yeah. are first cousins, there can be a likelihood of having a genetical disorder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's not uncommon in our communities actually for first cousins to marry. You it's know? not even still really. Yeah, actually. exactly. And it was something that was practiced by our imam. So I think very much the community yeah. feels that if there was something mm. uh, wrong with that, then mm. we would have been told that by, yeah. by our imam. So Absolutely. And I, and I, you know, there's yeah. always two sides yeah. of the coin. So you actually look at the other point that, you know, we have an iman that obviously the Western society sometimes doesn't and yeah. we have the iman that tells us that basically that if you do have a disabled child or a child with uh, rare disorders or rare illnesses that, you know, that is a test from Allah mm -hmm. and because we can cope so well because of our iman yeah. it makes it much, much more easier for us to deal with the situation rather than just see it as as something that's extraordinary. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I Definitely. A lot of your, um, what you've been saying is, is the central focus of it is, is safeguarding, right? Mm -hmm. It's safeguarding children, looking out for them and making sure that you can support them and people who work with young children, I guess, health-wise. Um, how can parents find out more about these kind of issues that affect young children. Specifically, I'm thinking of parents who have language barriers. It's very difficult these days for parents who perhaps don't speak any English at all mm. to find out more or even pick up signs that they can see in their young children because they don't know anything about it. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, if, um, I mean, one of the biggest problems that we have in our society uh, today is the language barrier. And there's a lot of things that are uh, there's a lot of problems uh, that children are faced with um, from uh, child abuse to all these uh, other issues where the children are into wrongdoings. Um, for example, um, they, um, they take um, wrong type of uh, dietary measures, that, um, so that's a, that affects them, uh, their, their metabolism. We see on a, uh, on a regular basis we have uh, patients that come into us, even including Muslim patients, where parents haven't got a clue what, what their children have been doing. So it makes, you know, once they've been highlighted by the doctors and they've been told that, did you know that your child uh, drinks a lot of, like, stimulant drinks and things? And that, you know, parents are shocked that they have these sort of problems because we have children that come in that are... That for for no apparent reason, they've been found unconscious. They've been fainting. Their heart beats quite fast. And doctors try to see, you know, what their dietary measures were. And they'll talk about, oh, we had um, a couple of extra st stimulant drinks that we had last night. But parents aren't always um, parents aren't always aware. So you know. So where do you draw the line in terms of? I mean, if it's if we're talking here about a teenager, for example, you know, you said you treat uh, children or. or up to the age of 16, where do you draw the, parent, the, the sort of doctor-patient confidentiality line? Mm -hmm. So if a teenager says to you, I don't want my mum to know that this has happened to me, or that I did this, or that I took this, or I drank that, um, how, what are your responsibilities in terms of telling their parents? Well, we do have to respect our guidelines, and um, any child above the age of um, 13 on the ward, um, any uh, information that he provides or, he, okay. uh, or we provide them, um, can remain confidential uh, as a part of a confidentiality rule, okay. but uh, you do have to respect the fact that you know the parents do need to know at some point that yeah. something is happening with their child. Yeah. But we obviously because there's so many different cases that we uh, we deal with, mm. it depends on exactly what type of measures we need to take and mm. what the problem with the child uh, actually is. Okay. And in terms of accident and emergency, I, I thought that would be um, interesting for perhaps our viewers to, to know. What are the common sorts of cases that come in with children getting into accidents and emergencies, things which are preventable or avoidable at home? Do you see any um, like that? Usually we have children that will come in um, and go undiagnosed by parents, which usually is that, you know, they've got a raised high temperature and, you know, even things like um, uh, things to look out for. Um, the biggest uh, major issue that we have at, um, 
on the wards is um, the lack of information that um, the Muslim society or the you know the Eastern society uh, has with regards to their child is not spotting the signs for meningococcal septicemia or meningitis as uh, as they also say and it seems that you know there's a few th very small things that we can do to avoid um, having to bring them in and or take them straight to the GP or take them straight to A&E without you know thinking about it so. Some of the issues that are, are happening at home is like maybe a very, very high temperature for about a constant day or so, or maybe you've just started to see purpley rash on the body. Maybe it's spreading, you haven't noticed that. Um, but there's small things like, you know, touching the glass on, and if you touch the back of the glass onto one of the rashes, mm -hmm. and then it's sort of like, um, if it doesn't go away instantly, it's called, you know, a non-blanching rash, which basically means that there is, you know, a rash that definitely needs to be seen straight away. So that's a test you could do at home? Absolutely. The other thing is uh, photophobia. Um, we always look out for signs uh, such as does your child feel squeamish at looking at the screen? You know, they, do they close their eyes to the to the light? You know, is there something like that? Do you feel they're having some difficulty moving their neck? Is there some sort of stiffness? So some of these things can be, uh, you know, seen very very quickly by parents and noticed, and then they can take um, precautionary measures by taking them into the A and E A ASAP. Okay. Do you ever see um, children coming in with emotional, uh, not necessarily physical Im you know, illnesses, but kind of emotional uh, needs or emotional trauma? Uh, do you ever see those kinds of cases in your work? We world? see a lot of those cases. Um, we see a lot of children that have been um, abused at home. Yeah. And by parents or by carers? Uh, by parent and carers really? at the same time, or even people that have just visited them or people that they've been in care with during the course of the day if their parents have been at work and things. And um, it's quite sad when you see those children. One particular case that we had um, uh, quite recently uh, was a child who had um, uh, bruise marks all over his body. He had broke a couple of broken ribs. He had um, fractures on his knuckles and um, we, you know, we pinpointed the fact that that child was being abused. Mm. Um, sadly, on uh, on that note, you know, there's a certain amount of pain that that child had tolerated yeah. because, as we know, if your child, any child, goes into hospital and has a blood test done, that child, you know, does not stop screaming and, uh, and crying. But this child was able to tolerate a blood test. Wow. And you know, we, of mm. course, we had to do many blood tests, mm. but that child did not scream or, mm. you know, he was just quiet. It shows you the level of tolerance. That Absolutely, to and that was sad to us because just looking yeah. at that child and you thought, how yeah. could somebody do that to you? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So then, obviously, we we, get, we have to take the safeguarding team uh, issue. We go through child protection route, yeah. and obviously, a lot of people have to be. Um, brought on like the police and the uh, social workers and things like that and measures have to be taken straight away. And do you find that those cases come in where parents have alcohol issues and drug related issues or do you f see differences in communities or do you think it's quite general across communities? I th I think a lot of it is to do with uh, drug abuse and a lot of it is to do with alcohol in the Western uh, society and a lot of the um, patients uh, that are not from the ethnic minorities. But then at the same time, um, in, in the community uh, nursing, you will see a lot of the Asian Muslim children that are being, uh, being pressured into uh, performing and therefore they find themselves right. vulnerable by yeah. their own parents. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to see what different communities, what sorts of pressures different communities yeah. put on their children, isn't it? I think that's yeah. So it's very interesting. I'm just conscious of the fact that everything we've said so far has been really hard hitting. Yeah. Do you ever come across any cases that are quite light-hearted, something that sort of makes you laugh, or does it generally tend to be quite serious cases by the time it uh, gets to you? Some cases that I have um, or, we, or I um, look at during uh, work is um, cases where we've got babies that come in, they're being overfed by their parents <laughs> and, then, and then the parents are, are saying that this child keeps vomiting oh, and it keeps no. vomiting and I'll be going back to them and saying that but how much feed did that child have and you'll yeah. find that it's a small issue yeah. which can be dealt with but it's first time parents absolutely yeah. and you'll find that they're just overfeeding their child and that's just a small uh, you know a small problem that that could have been dealt with at home but it's uh, sometimes you find that um, the advice they've been given in the community isn't always correct or sometimes you feel that their parents are forcing them to uh, you know every time the child baby cries at home it's a case of feed the baby, your baby's hungry. And it's yeah. not always that. Sometimes your baby just requires, um, you know, some sort of a security, cuddle a it's cuddle true. maybe, or maybe he just wants to come out of his routine. Yeah. And babies change their routine so many times within the first year of birth. And um, it's amazing.
Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Thank you so much for coming in. I've, I've learned so much and I'll definitely try to remember if I do have a baby, not to <laughs> overfeed it. Overfeed them, inshallah. <laughs> Excellent. We hope you enjoyed that discussion um, with Sister Ruhi. It's time for us to go for a short break now. Um, so, inshallah, we'll see you after the break in three minutes. very long time in schools and um, I think uh, it brought on that I needed to work more hands-on with them and do more clinical care with them which I wasn't able to do when I was um, in the education department um, but you know you could see the children that they required more health um, uh, care specifically to their needs and which I felt was um, an important part of um, what I wanted actually to do with the children because mm -hmm. um, I think it transferred to adult wards um, and basically we care for the acutely ill child, children that come in with rare disorders. Some we have oncology patients, which are the, our children that have uh, been diagnosed with cancer, leukemia, uh, tumours and things like that. We have children that come in with metabolic disorders. Some of them have to be transferred out to other, uh, other hospitals. And uh, basically we just provide them with the care that they should receive, mm -hmm. which is yeah. We are a nurse and I'm sure that you've got loads of a wealth of experience to kind of share with us. Can you tell us a bit about your work? Bismillah rahman rahim Yes, um, I've got experience of working with uh, general paediatrics for over six years now. And, I've, um, you know, we work with children from the age of um, when they're new newly born to us and uh, we cater for children and uh, care for their needs up until the age of 16, which is our cut-off point with them. And then obviously they aim to have good quality of care. Yeah. It's really interesting, actually, mm. to see what different careers people do, you know. I mean, uh, what, the, what Sister Ruhi does is so different to what you and I do, and yeah. it's very interesting to just have a glimpse into someone's life and mm -hmm. to see what motivates them in, into what they're doing. Um, so what kind of, how did you decide to choose to become a paediatric nurse? What led you to that path? Well, um, alhamdulillah, I was experienced in uh, working with children with special needs uh, for a very Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the second segment of Morning Break. We hope you're relaxed and settled with a hot drink, ready to enjoy the rest of the show. Okay, now it's time to introduce our guest, Sister Ruhi Rizvi. Thank Salam. you very much for coming to the show. Wa alaikum Lovely to have you. Um, let's, let's talk, you're a paediatric.